This morning we will talk about an important aspect from Jeremiah chapter 35. Jeremiah 35 has a story of a family. The f name of this family is the Rechabites. It's a very important chapter in the Bible that talks about a great commitment that this family made. The story goes like this. God told Jeremiah the prophet to go, verse 2, go to the Rechabite family and invite them to come to one of the side rooms of the house of the Lord and give them wine to drink. Invite them into the church, that is into the temple, and give them wine to drink. So what did Jeremiah do? He went and he told these people to come to the temple. And they came to one of the rooms and uh, verse 5, Then I set bowls full of wine and some cups before the men of the Rechabite family and said to them, Drink some wine. Now this is a prophet who has been asked by God to do this. And therefore what these people how they responded to this is important. Remember, this is all happening in secret. Nobody is around. It's only between the prophet and the family. And therefore, what's the response of this family is very important. Now, when you hear something from a prophet, what is a general trend? What, is, what do you usually do? You just blindly follow. You just blindly accept it and say, yeah, you told me, so I'll drink it. What did these people do? Is very, very important. When the drink was set before them, verse 6, they replied, we do not drink wine because our forefather, Jonadab, son of Rechab, gave us this command. What is the command? Neither you nor your descendants must ever drink wine. And you must never build houses, sow seed or plant vineyards. You must never have any of these things, but must always live in tents. Then you will live a long time in the land where you are nomads. We have obeyed everything our forefather Jonadab, son of Rechab, commanded us. Neither we nor our wives nor our sons and daughters have ever drunk wine or built houses to live in or had vineyards fields of crops. We have lived in tents and have fully obeyed everything our forefather Jonadab commanded us. But when Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon invaded the land, we said, come we must go to Jerusalem to escape the Babylonian and Aramean armies. So we have remained in Jerusalem. What you understand from this family is, they did not know why they were being invited to the temple. And once they came, the wine was set before them. So they could have drunk the wine. They could have. They could have always said, Jeremiah told us. Jeremiah said this before us. And he told us to drink the wine. And they could have easily justified and said, it's Jeremiah's fault. He made us drink. They were sitting at home and doing something else. A Jeremiah who came, of course, by the initiation by God. God told him to go. What I'm try, trying to tell you is, God knew the determination of the Rechabite family. And therefore he wanted to set this family as an example to the nations. Example to the nation. Though they were brought inside, when nobody is around, and the prophet himself offers wine, you know what they did? They refused. Why did they refuse drinking wine? It's because their forefather, Jonadab, told them, you shall not drink wine. Okay? 
Is Jonadab around anywhere? No. Is Jonadab watching? No. But they hung on to the command of their forefather. That is what God trying to show the country, the nation of Judah, and say, hey, this is one family. This family is ready to obey their forefather. Whatever they have been told. Verse 13, will you not learn a lesson and obey my words, declares the Lord. There are several aspects of this beautiful story that we can uh, think about. But what I want to talk today is, when, as we children of God, we hear many voices. There are many voices which keep telling us to do things. But we need to discern, we need to understand, and we need to obey God's voice only. Here, they had the command of their forefather. And Jeremiah comes and tells them, drink wine. So that is another command. There is one command by their forefather, and there is another contradictory command by the prophet. What did they do? They obeyed their forefather. Same thing happens in everyday life, in a believer's life. Every time there are certain voices which keep talking to you. And therefore we must stick to the voice of God. Let me tell you another story. 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13 has a beautiful story of a young prophet. His name is not given. And this king, Jeroboam, was a wicked man. And uh, he was uh, making an offering. He's not supposed to, is it not? The king is not supposed to make an offering. It is a priest who is supposed to. But he was making an offering. And that is when a young man, he came, a prophet, he came and confronted the king. What a great and mighty, uh, strong young man he should be to go and confront the king and then uh, tell him, what you're doing is not right. What happened here? Let's see the story. With the, by the word of God, verse 1. 1 Kings 13 and 1. The, by the word of God, a man of God came from the Judah to Bethel. As Jeroboam was standing by the altar to make an offering, he cried out against the altar by the word of God, Lord, O altar, altar. This is what the Lord says. A son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On you he will sacrifice the priests of the high places who now make offerings here and human bones will be burned on you. That same day, the man of God gave a sign. This is the sign the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart and ashes on it will be poured out. So what happened? After this prophecy, and you see the king, uh, verse 4. When King Jeroboam heard what the man of God cried out against the altar at Bethel, he stretched out his hand from the altar and said, Seize him. But the hand he stretched out toward the man shriveled up so that he could not pull it back. You know? The king commanded and said, catch him. What happened? His, got, his hand got stuck like this. He couldn't pull it back. Can you imagine a king walking like this? Everywhere. His hand is like this. His hand got stuck. And then the man of God, the young man came, he prayed. And then the hand came back. And then the king said, what? Come home and eat in my house. Is it a big deal? No. Going and eating in a king's house? Uh, is there anything to say no? No, not necessary. But he refused. Why did this young man refuse? You see, verse 8. But the man of God answered the king, Even if you were to give me half your possessions, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water here. 
for I was commanded by the Lord of God, word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water or return by the same way you came. So he took another road and did not return by the way he had come to Bethel. So he, when he came to the king, and the king said, come and eat my house, what did he say? No, it's not going to happen. Because God told me not to eat food anywhere and I'm not even supposed to go back the same route I came. I need to go a different route. So he refused. He refused what the king was offering. What the king was offering. Is it not important? You hear a voice from God and you hear a voice from another human. What should you do? You should listen to the voice of God. Now, does it, uh, let's, let's take another example and then we'll come to think about a few more things. Okay, uh, what did this man do? Did he, did he, what happened to this man's life? This is what the contrast that you find in his behavior. He started walking. And then the story of what happened to the king spread throughout the country. In no time, it spread like wildfire. That king's hand got shriveled up. A young man from uh, Judah, he came to Bethel. And then he challenged the king. And then all these things happened. Wow, it's a national news. Everybody in the country got to know this. So therefore, one senior prophet, a senior prophet, he wanted to meet this young man. And what did he do? He met this man. And then verse 15, he says, So the prophet said to him, Come home with me and eat. Verse 16, The man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water with you in, in this place. I've been told by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water there or return by the way you came. Is it not the same answer he gave to the king? Yes. Therefore he said, Sir, I'm not supposed to eat. I'm not supposed to go, by the, go back by the same route. Therefore, verse 18. What did the old prophet do? The old prophet answered, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel said to me by the word of the Lord, Bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying to him. So the man of God returned with him and ate and drank in his house. Did you see what happened here? God told him something. And then the senior prophet, the uh, old prophet, told him, Hey, an angel came and told me that you need to come and eat in my house. Now please remember, the angel is the angel of God. God told him not to eat. When God told him not to eat, and when somebody is coming and telling you that the angel of God came and told me that you should eat, Right there you find something is fishy. Because. Why didn't God come and tell you? God told somebody else. So now there is another voice. That's the voice of the prophet. Now how can God be fork-tongued? Why would God tell you something and tell the other person something else? God will never do that. God knows, God's not a deceiver. He will not tell one thing to you and tell another thing to another person. This young man did not recognize that. He thought, maybe yeah, God told me to go and eat in his house. He was very strong against the ungodly king. But you know what? He fizzled out in front of an old prophet. Many times we are not able to stand our ground in front of seniors in our churches, but we are able to stand ground in front of outsiders. Please remember, the ground is more slippery within the Christian atmosphere. We tend to yield to somebody without discerning without asking God if he really told this man to come and eat in his house. The young man should have asked God, Lord, you told me not to eat. 
How come this guy is coming and telling me that you told him to eat? There is something wrong somewhere. Either what you spoke to me is not you who spoke to me, or this man is lying. The young man did not double check with God. What happened? It's a big tragedy that happened. Please remember one thing. Let me finish this and then come back to this point. God will never tell one thing to a person and tell another thing to another person. Let me tell you two examples, three examples. Number one, in Exodus, you find God was trying to tell Moses to lead the people and Moses was giving excuses after excuses. So what did God say? Okay, uh, God was very angry with him was very angry with him. Chapter 4 and verse 14. Exodus 4 and 14. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses and he said, What about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you and his heart will be glad when he sees you. You shall speak to him and I put words in his mouth and I will help both of you speak and he will and will teach you what to do. Now turn to the same chapter and verse 27, verse 27, the Lord said to Aaron, go into the desert and meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say and also about all the miraculous signs he had commanded him to perform. See, the Lord came to Aaron and told him to go and meet Moses. God had told Moses, that Aaron would be the spokesman. God himself went to Aaron and said, you need to put your GPS towards Moses. You need to go and meet him. I'll tell you another example. In Acts chapter uh, 9, in the conversion story of Saul, you find something interesting. When he was blinded, he went to a, the house of a man uh, called Judas, and he was in a street called the Straight Street. Verse 12, in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias. See, verse 10, in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called, him to, uh, called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias and place his hands on him to restore his sight. You see, in a vision he has seen a man. Who has seen a man? Saul has seen a man. He has seen a man in his vision. And then verse nine. Uh, then uh, verse 17 says, Ananias went into the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. The same God who met Saul met Ananias too. Did you see that? In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias. Who gave the vision? God gave the vision. God gave the vision to Ananias also. The, so God appeared to Saul and told him about Ananias. And God appeared to Ananias and told him about Saul. So if anybody comes and tells you that God told me, you have to stop them and say, wait, if God told you, he will tell me also. Turn the page to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. This is the story of Cornelius. In the story of Cornelius, God told him something. Verse 5, now send a man, send men to Joppa to bring a man named Simon who is called Peter. So the angel told him to send for, to bring back a man whose name is Peter. Now if you read further, Peter was on the rooftop and he had a vision. And when he had a vision, there were some people who had come to him. Okay, verse 9, about noon the following day as they were on their journey, 
and approaching the city, Peter went up the, onto the roof to pray. Verse 19, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the, as he got a vision about that, you know, uh, uh, the sheet coming down with all kinds of unclean animals. So after the vision was done, in verse 19 you find this. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Did you see? God sent an angel and told Cornelius to invite Peter. The same God went to Peter and told him to go with these three men. And these three men are uh, going to tell him that they have come from Cornelius. So God is trying to bridge these two groups. Did you see? Moses and Aaron, Saul and Ananias, Cornelius and Peter. So when God tells you something, he will tell the other person also who is involved in that the same thing. There will never be clash. God will not tell one thing to one person and tell another thing to another person. I have had people who come, came to me and told me, God told me something about you. I said, I don't want to hear. Or if you tell me, I'll wait. I won't buy it. I won't buy it right away. You need to wait. Because if God told you, he will tell me also. That's very, very important. That's where people are going astray these days. They really don't know which voice to heed to. Therefore, what happened to this young man in 1 Kings chapter 13? He had a voice from God and he had another voice, a conflicting voice from the senior prophet. Okay, he went home and ate. He was not supposed to. He went home and ate. What happened? Verse 21, uh, 20 and 21. While they were eating, sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet who had brought him back. He cried out to the man of God who had come from Judah. This is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord and have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. You came back and ate bread and drank water in the place where you were told not to eat or drink. Therefore, your body will not be buried in the tomb of your fathers. When the man of God had finished eating and drinking, the prophet who had brought him back saddled his donkey for him. As he went on his way, a lion met him on the road and killed him, and his body was thrown down on the road with both the donkey and the lion standing beside it. Interestingly, the lion did not eat this man. It didn't do any harm to the donkey. It just killed this man. And I want you to look at what the senior prophet said about this young man. Verse 26. When the man who had brought him back from his journey heard of it, he said, It is the man of God who defied the word of the Lord. The Lord has given him over to the lion, which has mauled him and killed him, as the word of Lord had warned him. If you ask me in simple words, this is what is written on his tombstone. After doing such a great ministry, after doing so many wonderful things, this is the reply. This is the uh, ultimate statement of his life. What does he carry back? What is the reputation he has? This is what the reputation is. If you ask me what was written on the, on the tombstone of this man, this is what is written. The man who defied the word of God. The man who defied the word of God. This man was told not to eat. Just because some other human came and told me, told him that he must eat, he went and ate. As he was eating and drinking, he was told, you will not be buried in your father's tomb. In those days, being buried in your father's tomb was a great honor. It was a great honor. I don't know if you have seen this in the cemeteries. Many people, they try to, if the husband died before, the wife would say, I want to be buried next to my husband. Or if the wife dies, you know, the husband would say, I want to be buried next. Some people buy some spaces for both of them. Yeah? In some countries, they bury 
uh, one over the other. So there, I mean, my, my parents were buried like that. My dad died first and he was buried and then my mom, seven years later, then he, uh, she was buried. It's, I mean, there's nothing in that, you know, of course, but it's, it's all the way different. It's very different. It's a respect. Being buried in your father's tomb. This man did not have that honor. Reason? He did not obey God's word. We must remember this. We will always have several voices talking to us. We must be able to discern. I want to give you an example. I always used to think this. In the whole church, when the service was going on, if my dad cleared his throat, I knew that was my dad. In the middle of thousand people, and if it was audible, and if I cleared my throat, my dad would know it's my son. How? Because we live in the same house. We interact so much. I can know. In fact, even a pet dog in your house can identify the way you walk. If there is somebody, a stranger, he'll bark. If you are there, he knows it's you. As you're walking along the hallway, you can easily sit in your bedroom and tell who is walking. Why? Because you live with them. That is intimacy. Sensitivity to what God is saying. That's when you hear him close. That's when you listen to him close. That's the kind of life God wants us to lead. That we be sensitive to his voice. Because there are so many voices which are trying to destroy us. There's so many voices which are trying to destroy us. And God wants to rebuild us. God wants us to help us. God wants to bless us. Therefore, we have to listen to him. He paid his price, a very huge price. He shed his blood for us on the cross. That we may be blessed by him. He doesn't want us to be destroyed. He doesn't want us to be losers. And therefore he has given his word. He was, wants us to be very sensitive and hear what he is telling us. Rechabite family, they obeyed their fa forefather. This young man partially obeyed what he was told. And I'll tell you third example and then close. Adam and e Eve in the Garden of Eden. When Satan came and spoke to Eve, you know what she should have done? She should have listened to God's word which was told to her through her husband. She should have said, I want you to look at something interesting there, Genesis chapter 4, Genesis 3, sorry, Genesis 3. Look at how Satan starts the conversation, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now when somebody starts a conversation like that, it means he overheard, eavesdropped on what God was telling the man. What was that? Did God, see, if he has to begin, he should begin like, um, oh, did you talk to God uh, recently? Oh, what did he tell you? You have to get it from her and then you start off saying what? Uh, what did God tell you? Oh, he told us not to. Oh, really? Oh, really? Did he tell you? Like? So, he didn't start there. You know where Satan started? He started with questioning God and his word. He said what? Did God really say you must not eat from the tree, in the, uh, from any tree in the garden? Now, why, did he, why does he suddenly start this conversation about tree and the eating and the fruit in the garden? 
I want to tell you something interesting. The reason why he brought in this is, he told her a lie. What is that? For God knows, verse 5, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Right? You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, I want to tell you, the reason why he brought in this temptation is very crucial. Please remember, if Eve overcomes this temptation, Satan has lost the chance to defeat Eve. Because this is the first time he's coming and he must come with his strongest weapon. Because if she realizes this guy is trying to tempt me, next time when he comes she'll be all the more careful. If she wins it first time, she'll be careful the second time. So therefore Satan has to come with his strongest weapon. What is his strongest weapon? He knows one thing for sure. God will not share his glory with anybody. He will not share his glory with anybody. And what did he say? You will become like God. Please remember, Satan was thrown down from heaven because he wanted to exalt himself to the level of God. And when anybody tries to do that, God will not tolerate it and he will throw anybody down. And therefore he came with that temptation. What happened? Eve yielded to the voice of Satan. How many times did Satan and Eve have a con had, a, had a conversation before? This is the first time. First time. And Eve listened to the voice of Satan. There came the fall. Please remember... We have many voices in this world. In this world we have many voices. And we need to listen to and stick to God's voice alone. Rechabite family is the best example. To take caution you can remember this young man in 1 Kings 13. And also you can take caution from Eve that you better listen to God. Because once you listen to the enemy, you will fall. You will fall. So it is God's desire that we listen to him and we obey him. Does it mean that we don't respect other people? Now there's another extreme here in this case. Does it mean that we don't respect other people? We don't listen to anybody and say, I'm going to be arrogant. I don't care for you. I don't want to listen to you. No. No. We need to uh, take advice. Bible says we need to take advice. Let me show you one verse. Proverbs 11 and 14. Proverbs 11 and 14. In the, uh, I like this in the uh, King James Version. Let me read the uh, uh, NIV first and then I'll read the King James Version. In NIV it says, For a lack of guidance, a nation... False. Did you see that? For a lack of uh, uh, guidance, the nation falls. But many advisors make a victory sure. Many advisors make victory sure. Let me read it from the King James Version. It says, where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. There is safety. So when you uh, have... Now, people around you, when you have counselors, you have your seniors, you should listen to them. But obedience to whatever they say is subject to test. You can take their advice, you can take their advice, but you must take it to God and ask him, Lord, this is what my brother told me. Is this what your will is? Let me show you Proverbs 15 and 22. Plans of fail for a lack of counsel. Proverbs 15, 22. Plans fail for a lack of counsel. But with many advisors, they succeed. But with many advisors, they succeed.
You see that? So we certainly have uh, to take advice from uh, people who have had experience. But when it comes to decision making, to finalizing whether to do this or not, we must depend on God. We must always depend on God. So therefore, it's my prayer that we learn this lesson and say, Lord, I want to obey you. I will respect all my seniors. I will take their advice. I learn from their experience, but I will yield to you and you alone. May God help us to be obedient to his voice and word. Let's pray.